six four. I'm just turning these on right now. We don't need to listen to that one. I just want to make sure we're not getting anything. See So that's why we have the extra mic in this room. Sure. Um, so, wait, are there three handhelds in here or two? We're going around testing mics. Oh, uh, okay. okay. Um, so, just, you know, FYI, you know, moderator will use the lab, and the handhelds will probably be used by the people on stage. Maybe they'll pass it back into the audience. We'll see. Okay. Uh, but I just wanted to kind of give you the heads up that there's going to be a ton of people. This is uh, 1 o'clock for, for the session. Yeah, I'll be here in this room, so I'll, I'll make sure everyone's connected and stuff. Yeah, yeah, cool. Does it make sense to come 10, 15 minutes before then? Or? I don't think it's going to be that hard. Because uh, they're just going to pass the mic back and forth okay. uh, to answer questions. But people are going to come early at that time, you think? Or? Um, I don't, hey, Serena, when, when do you think your crew is going to show? 10 up. 10 up? Yeah. Okay. Cool. So, so yeah, any of you guys know what's happening. So if you need help. Okay. No, 10's fine. I can check them and have them earlier. Thank you. All right, thank you, Bruce Russ. Thank you. We're just going to go to, yeah, no, why not? Just so we can be absolutely sure, right? I can get to it this way, right? There's no audio cable. Sure. I think we'll be fine, but if you have some, it's kind of great. Do you have um, audio in the laptop presentation? No. Only, it, no. Only slides? The only audio. Video or not video? No, no, nothing like this. Okay. All the audio I'm going to use is going to come from here. Well, so, yeah. Uh, yeah. Oh, gotcha. Cables should be close by. So we've got this um, audio line hooked up to hit the mixer in the back, so that way it can get recorded on the camera they have set up there. I got you. No worries. I just said I think if I turn on the volume up for this room, I think we'll be fine. Well, this will um, this will play through the room as well. So oh, this yeah? is your direct yeah. This is your direct input. Um, and we can, uh, since it's early, we can test the volume, make sure it's not too loud. Or where is it? I think I have a, a hand on it right here. Oh yeah, go for it. It's this one here. Sorry, I got my hands full. But that's your direct inputs. Thank you. 
Right here? Sure. I still have to uh, connect her with the Wi-Fi, so she probably won't work before that. So, just a second.
One, two, two, two. This is this one. This one is conference audit.
Hello everyone. Am I audible? Yes. At the back. Alright. Quiz which should actually be on the user side are tilted more towards the developer side. So that was my argument and we didn't want to remove this coupling. So we suggested that why not have a separate person come as a cynic and provide that additional user perspective to the sprint team. So while doing so, while doing so, I came across this bias called as uh, curse of knowledge. Okay, and the curse of knowledge means that when you're talking to someone, you automatically assume that people have a background to understand, right? So let's say there is a uh, there is a professor of physics or quantum physics, whatever theoretical physics and he has to teach to kindergarten kids is that a good match it's not right because at the, at his level of knowledge he will kind of assume that they have some background of science or physics or something right <coughs> i'm sorry so this is this is how biases uh, affect our decision making in day to day life more so in testing all right let's play a game now so if you look at the screen there are two jars jar a has two black and two red balls okay so far so good jar b also has four balls but we are not aware of the color the only thing i can guarantee you is that jar b also has either black balls or red balls okay there is no third color so jar b can either be all black or red three black one red all those combinations okay all right so now you have a uh, hundred dollar prize for randomly drawing a black ball which jar do you think has more probability of drawing a black ball jar a or jar b a, a? so who do you those who think a raise their hands and those who think it's B raise their hands or anyone anyone who would like to tell me why it's A all right because A there's a 50% chance of drawing a black ball B you know, there's, it could be any combination of those. You have no idea what it is. So you have to assume 50% chance. Of is a better chance? So. so all right. That, that is one way of looking at it. Any other any other arguments? Yes. So I'm going to assume it as B because there is no way to determine how many black balls are there. Mm -hmm. I'm picking a good case and assuming all four are black and then in that way I can find it. That's okay. The way. Or in the worst, there can be all red in that way. There is no way to do that. So B in my case would be a best bet because in the highest possible case of all mm -hmm. black Okay. Anyone else? Okay. Oh, I think we are assuming there will be a lot more black words in B. That's an assumption. Yeah. Yes. That is what you are not supposed to do. If you are a tester, just go with what you have. Mm -hmm. So it might be like uh, all the balls in B are black, but it might be bad as well. So the better probability that you have is what you see. So okay. you see there is two black words. All right. All right. If there are uh, no other arguments, then I'll go ahead. Or you want to say a, something? A? A, at least you got to B, there's a chance that you can you don't get anything. <laughs> All right. That is, uh, that is a safe way of looking at it. So I'll tell you the thing. Mathematically, both the jars have same probability of uh, drawing a black ball. Why? Because there are just two colors. Total number of favorable outcomes divided by total number of outcomes. Right? When you drive ball, it is either black or red in both the jars. So 50% chance in both the jars. But some people said A, those are the people, I don't want to judge, but those are the people who put their money in real estate and government bonds. 
and the other people who said B, like you, they usually go towards stock market, <laughs> startups, stuff like that. <laughs> you get where I, you you understand where I'm getting to. So there is there is an uh, there is a tendency in humans to avert the risk. Some humans, right? Not everyone. Some people leave their jobs and start a new thing. That is taking risk because you know that on the there would be no paychecks first. But there are chances that your business would be successful. Correct? So this thing is called ambiguity uh, paradox. And how does it impact testing? So we are talking about testing and software development here, right? How many people are aware of user stories? Right, everyone. All right. So take this. We are building a software of uh, a school management system or a student management system, right? For simplicity. And I am a front-end developer. I need the back-end team to give me an API where I can create, read, update, delete the student record, existing student record with a new Boolean field called need scholarship, right? So there are various business factors on which a college or a school decides that a particular student will get a scholarship, right? But that has also be maintained in their digital system of records, correct? So now we are adding that Boolean field on the student object that this particular, if this is true, then that person will get a scholarship, correct? As soon as this story hits a tester, these are the questions in his mind, okay? The first thing is releasing story on time. What does your product, has your product owner promised a date to the stakeholders, right? This is a big factor, correct? Do you know enough about this change? Are you aware of the how school works, how their business, what their business rules are to impact such a change? The third thing is, how about you start automating whatever you know. You know uh, two or three things about this story. You'll start automating so that you at least build the regression suite first. Okay? And the fourth thing is, what systems would be the source of truth? And there, there would be, if it is a multi-tier system, there would be either a database or a dumb backend or an intelligent backend, which would be the source of truth for this, this field, right? Where the actual information of this Boolean resides. So, uh, are you, uh, do you want to know about that also, or, or uh, would you just uh, uh, send some API, uh, send some requests, and see whether it's getting populated, the response is correct, and be done with it? So these are some of the uh, thoughts which a tester would have when the user story hits it. So based on the A and B analogy, the testers who take risks will check all four questions, okay? Including the last one, which is very important. Testers who play safe will just do one and two. Right? So now that we are aware about this bias, we can actually go ahead and do all four. Correct? So the best thing with every bias is to be aware of it. Right? Correct? So again with the uh, investment example, if you have a friend, you are a safe person who plays safe, who invests in government bonds and stuff like that. But you have a friend who is earning good at the stock market. He pushes you to invest in stock market. He teaches you how it works slowly and gradually. The thing with ambiguity aversion is that once you start experimenting with it, and once you, uh, you'll fail a couple of times, but eventually you will be good at it. So the best practice is to take the ambiguity head on and deal with it for, let's say, two or three times you may find it difficult, but eventually you'll be good at it. 
All right, the second bias. Second bias is the congruence bias. It's a brain glitch which uh, stops us from thinking out of the box. Now I'll give you a very good example. A couple of months ago, I was, uh, you, you won't get the perspective, but the Game of Thrones episode actually in India, it comes early morning at six. Okay, so I came back from the gym. I sat down, I turned on the season 8 episode 5 and since I was hungry I needed some post-workout snack. I went to the fridge, came back and you know that this season was all about, it was very dim, right? So I was looking for the remote to turn the brightness on. But I could not find the remote. And I looked everywhere. When I say everywhere, I looked everywhere, I could not find the remote because I was not sure what was going on on the screen. Then, uh, after 30 minutes or so, my wife found the remote in the refrigerator. <laughs> so, can you imagine what happened? So, there was an imaginary box of possibilities which my mind created. And that box contains all the possible locations where I can keep the remote. Shelf of the kitchen, couch, corner of the couch behind cushion everywhere right inside the fridge is not part of that box it's a brain glitch correct so if you in terms of testing if you can go out of that there is no clear way of going out of that box right there is no clear way but you can at least try if you are aware that i'm not trying enough but you can make then then you can make a conscious effort all right, let's take this example. Successful test engineers. I I have hired a lot of test engineers in past two, three years. But we look at, this is just my perspective, you can disagree. I think the person should be very creative. Unlike development where you know that, okay, you created a function, it's working, you wrote two unit tests, and you know it's, it's finite. And unlike development, testing is more like an art. Right? It's not finite. You have to stop somewhere. It's not, you can go on and keep testing a function for uh, infinite long time. Right? And the second quality is persistence. He has to be persistent. If the developers will usually say it's not a bug, we won't fix. But if you think it's a bug, it will affect the user then. It is a bug, right? The third thing is keen observation. Like my wife, she can find the remote in the fridge. Right? All right. Let's say we are now building a system. We are building a system uh, where there is a there is a um, resource management system, whatever. Right? an organization and the record of every employee in that organization. Their, their roles can be developers. You look at the role, uh, is a tester. The second one is also tester, right? The other roles can be developers, managers, um, business analysts, stuff like that, okay? And I am now a QE who has to test this API. So they are saying that if there are four boolean fields, three boolean fields, is great tester, keen observation and persistent, correct? If all three are set to true, then great tester is set to true. All three, it's an AND gate, okay? All three are set to true, then great tester is set. This is the business logic, resides in API. All you have to do is send all three to true and see whether the person is returning as the greatest is returning as true correct can you think of any other corner cases in this let's say you are a tester you are testing this application where you have been told that there are three fields three quality fields right the adjectives of a person of your employee if these three fields are true the great tester boolean should also be true it's a logic, business logic, right? 
Can you think of any other corner cases? Yes, please. Uh, two are true, one is false. Come again. Two, two of the qualities are marked as true and one of them is marked as false. Okay, so... Right, so you are saying that eventually we will end up uh, drawing a table where uh, we will uh, choose all permutations of all these three booleans, correct? And see what are the results, right? For just one of the combination where all three are true, the gray tester should be true. For everything else, it should be false, correct? Yes. What else? You're still thinking inside the box. Yes, please. Not a, Not a boolean. Good, good thinking. So she will uh, probably send a free text, right? Free text. A B C D E F G H. What else? You raise your hand. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I, I didn't get you. Can someone? Can you give him the mic? Missing, missing data field. Missing data field. Yes. You just send the two fields and keep one as null. Correct? Yes. That's a good. That's a good test. But still inside the box. Not a boolean, but a common substitute like one or zero. Yep. Still inside the box. What else? Think outside the box, inside the refrigerator. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's a good security test. We can supply the HTML, we can supply a special characters, multi-byte characters, right? I mean, talking about, okay, if I said to this and, and this, it becomes that I, what about checking the existing data? Yes, yes. That, that's the way to do it, but it's still inside the box. Now, I'll tell you, in the interest of time. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, <clears throat> as I told you, there were a lot of other employees, right? Did anyone check that, are we turning the CEO of the company into a great tester? Right? He's also a role. Are we turning a developer or a business analyst into a great tester? Correct? So there were other roles which we did not look at. So to deal with it, I, I created this model. Once you get a user story, start from start from the line where code was changed inside the code base and move your way up outside. Like from the code base, you go to text stack. Like there are different tiers, right? There is a back end, there is a mid tier, and there is a front end. Then you go towards user's workflow. How does user look at it, right? What are their top 20 use cases while dealing with this application? This is not this is not something which is very practical because once you start doing it, there is there is a, uh, a risk that you will provide a very late feedback to your developers, which is not desired, right? Because you are starting from inside and going outside. All right. Any questions so far? All right. Now there is a third kind of bias called urgency bias. The urgency bias, what it does is, uh, let's say you are you are a developer working on something. There is a bigger goal consisting of a huge backlog. So instead of PO deciding what to do, if on a given day I give a developer a chance to decide what to do, he will eventually pick up the shortest user story first. Why? Because there is there is an immediate high of completing user story. <laughs> there is instant gratification. 
the longer user stories like which takes two weeks or three weeks it is long right you you want to do it but it does not take you to your goal in a matter of day right so what this bias tells us that us is that uh, we normally fail to make the distinction between what is urgent and what is important right what we think is important is actually very urgent to do and the other wise also so i will i'll give you my example let's say you are managing a team and you assume that they will do couple of things and once the deadline comes you see that two of those things were not done then you talk to them and they say that i did not get the time to do those two things right why is that because of this bias they fail to prioritize things in a way which which was established by your team or you fail to establish a urgency or priority of the things right in a correct way which then led them to get hampered by this bias picking up things which were urgent but not important all right so how do we deal with urgency biases uh, one us president in i think 70s created this productivity tool called eisenhower matrix so what it does is it tells you to create these four quadrants as a tester i will create these four quadrants for my daily jobs if it is important and urgent i'll do it just straight away right if it is important and not urgent then i will schedule giving it a time stamp also that i will do it on let's say 4 pm thursday and if it is not important but urgent you don't have the bandwidth to do it but it is urgent then you will delegate it to someone else you have to get it off your plate for someone else to pick because uh, there has to be some uh, accountability on the thing right and if, if it is not important neither urgent then pro probably eliminate it right why maintain two different sets of for example people who go into e2e bdd like they have uh, feature files everyone understands feature files okay they have feature files as well as regular test cases so there is no need of both of these things right so you can then eliminate one of it correct last time i gave this talk uh, in india there was a there was a joke on this slide uh, which said that at one time uh, us presidents were creating productivity tools can you imagine all right any questions you have a question do you now yes please i'll have the mic here for the questions oh sure Um, you gave the example of uh, if a dev, dev has to choose between a bunch of things, they'll do the thing that uh, they can feel they can complete the quickest. Mm -hmm. Is that an example then of choosing something urgent over something important? Yes. Okay. Thanks. And that happens when there is a decision maker who does not uh, who does not implement. A, clear understanding of the priority of the things which the group is doing any other questions all right then i'll give you back your 10 minutes